The Atlanta Braves got some unfortunate news on Thursday as Rysel Iglesias will begin the season on the IL, leading to one of our many great mailbag questions and who will step up in his place and get those opportunities to save out games early in the year. I'll answer that and many other of your mailbag questions on this episode of Lockdown Braves. So let's get into it. You are locked on Braves. Your daily Atlanta Braves podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Hey, and welcome back to Lockdown Braves, part of Lockdown Sports Atlanta, where we cover your favorite Atlanta sports teams each and every day. I'm your host, Jake Mastriani. You can follow me on Twitter at Shortstop Ball. Also, make sure you check out the podcast on Twitter at Lockdown underscore Braves. You can also check out my Braves written work over at Braves Today. That's si.com slash MLB slash Braves. You want to check out all the great content that we're pushing out over there. Also, make sure you follow me on Twitch, twitch.tv slash shortstopball, where I'll be playing some MLB The Show 23 on Thursday night as that game releases, and I'll be playing it over the weekend as well. And then during the season, hope to do some watch parties with some Braves game, playing some MLB The Show as well. So if you like Twitch, you want to come over and get some more content, you can follow me there as well, because I probably won't be doing as many live podcasts during the regular season. So that'd be another opportunity there to have some back and forth live conversations. As always, make sure you follow the podcast uh, on Twitter again at Lockdown underscore Braves. Make sure that you rate, review, and subscribe to the Lockdown Braves podcast wherever you listen to your podcast because it's available wherever you want to listen. If you're new on YouTube, subscribe there. Hit that thumbs up button. And thanks, as always, for making Lockdown Braves your first listen of each and every day. Game Time is our new sponsor on the podcast we're really excited about. Download the Game Time app. It's going to help you. Get those last minute tickets, create an account, and use code locked on MLB for $20 off your first purchase. A last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed at game time. This is our final mailbag episode before opening day. It is here. I cannot tell you how excited I am. You got MLB the show coming out tonight, which is kind of the kickoff for the upcoming season. And then a week from when we're recording this, the Braves will have already gotten their first win of the year. Let's hope that's the case in D.C. But it's coming. Opening day is here. This is our final mailbag podcast. Once we get into the season, I'll really only do mailbag podcasts during off days. So won't be as routine as it is now, but we'll still do some here and there. So got a lot of good questions to get to. But then next week, we're really going to jump into our predictions for the upcoming season for the Braves. Well, let's jump into these questions here. Cavs Buckeyes says, are there any sides aside from launch angle that you will look for with Acuna early on? And yes, there are, but the launch angle one is a really big one. I mean, it was such a significant drop last year from what we're used to. And I think that's all just due to the fact he didn't trust that knee and wasn't able to get under those baseballs. So that is definitely the number one thing I'm going to be watching. But I'm also just going to be watching his plate discipline. Discipline, You know, he's going to strike out a lot. That's just who he is. Look, Mike Trout strikes out a ton, but he's maybe the best hitter uh, of all time. But I would like to see him be a little bit more selective and take some more walks. His walk percentage went from 13.6% in 2021 to 9.9% in 2022. So a pretty big decrease there. And also his zone swing percentage. So or is, is uh, the number of p- pitches he swung out outside the zone rather went from 23% to 28%. So he was swinging at a lot more pitches out of the zone last year as well. So hoping, you know, we see improvements there that he gets back to kind of his norms where he, where he was getting that launch angle, not chasing as much, being more selective, taking more walks. Those are some of the things I'm looking for. And then defensively as well. It was a big drop-off defensively last year, and for many reasons, I think the Braves, and we have heard as much, that the Braves told him to be a little bit more cautious, You know, running the bases, picking his spots, and defensively as well. He was not the defensive player last year that we're used to, so I'll be watching for that too to see if he's chasing after balls in the gaps more, if he takes a couple more risks in the outfield, diving for balls. So those are the things I'll be looking for, for with Acuna this year to see if he's going to be able to get back to that MVP level of production like I and many think that he will. 
Large Lar says, who's a closer now that Iglesias is hurt? Mentor is a good choice, but I see it more as a committee. Lots of good arms. And yeah, that's a great point there. There are lots of good arms and there's lots of good option. And it's why it was so important that the Braves go out and build all that bullpen depth that they have. I do think Minter gets the bulk of opportunities early while Iglesias is out. I mean, he was unhittable in the beginning of last year was Minter, and he was still really good in the second half. But I think he may be the best reliever on the team. So I think he gets those first opportunities. But you're right. It could be a combination. It could be a committee of pitchers. There's several guys on there with closer experience. I think it could come down to situational um, lineup situations, whether righties or lefties are coming up in the eighth or ninth inning between Minter and Jimenez as to who gets those innings. But I think it's likely Minter and Jimenez that get the bulk of the opportunities to close games early on. Um, Robert Mullis says, sticky stuff. It's okay for batters in the form of pine tar, but not for pitchers. Before it was banned, what legal substances would the pitchers use to help them grip the ball better? And this is something else I haven't mentioned on here yet, but Major League Baseball has said they're going to start being a little bit more um, restrictive on checking for sticky stuff. If you noticed last year for the most of the season, it was just became a formality when pitchers came off the mound. Umpires just bright, uh, you know, lightly brushed their hands across the pitcher's hands. It wasn't anything, you know, too, too, it wasn't, you know, like going through TSA or anything at the airport. It was, you know, even more casual than that. Baseball said they're going to step up in that regard. But as far as what pitchers used to use, let me know if you know of some others as well. But I know some would use pine tar uh, if they could, you know, they'd hide it, you know, somewhere on their, on their hat or in their uniform and just touch it throughout the game. Some would use a combination of rosin and sunscreen. So, you know, they might put some sunscreen on their arm, tap the rosin bag on their arm, and then touch it when they need to uh, to get a little bit more tacky grip on their fingers. So that's a couple of things that I know pitchers would do. Again, if you know some others, you can comment down in the YouTube on YouTube or um, respond to the question on Twitter as well if you know of some others. Got a lot of other great questions to get to, including some on Shoemake and Grissom, when they could come up and what type of impact that could have. The 98 Braves <laughs> got a question about a song about the 98 Braves, which led me down a rabbit hole. We'll discuss that as well. And who should be batting second for the Braves? Should it be Michael Harris? Should it be Matt Olson? We'll discuss that next. If you're stressing about getting last minute tickets to the Braves home opener, then you can go to check out game time and told you about them at the top of the podcast. Buying tickets to your favorite events shouldn't be stressful. Game time is the fast and easy way to buy tickets for all sports, music, comedy, and theater near you. With killer deals on last minute tickets and their best price guarantee, you can stop stressing over the tickets and start getting pumped up and excited as I am for baseball season for the fun that you're going to have after you buy these tickets. Forget planning months in advance. Game Time has deals on tickets right up to the day of the event. Get exclusive flash deals on tickets for football, basketball, baseball, concerts, comedy, theater, and more. Anything that you're looking to go to that requires a ticket, you can go to Game Time for that. The Game Time guarantee means you'll always get the best price. And if you find a ticket in the same section for the same row for less, Game Time will credit you 110% of the difference snag the tickets without the stress with game time download the game time app create an account and use the code locked on mlb for 20 dollars off your first purchase this is very important you know you're buying tickets to games this year so download the game time app and use code locked on mlb to get 20 dollars off your first pit purchase for whatever tickets for the game that you're going to go to hopefully it's a braves game hopefully i see you there terms apply again create an account redeem code locked on mlb for 20 dollars off Download game time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. We talk about this sponsor as well a lot here. If you're getting excited about the upcoming season and fantasy baseball, obviously probably doing a lot of leagues, but you want to get into a real GM simulation league, then you got to try Ultimate Pro Baseball GM. Ultimate Pro Baseball GM is a mobile game that lets you manage your own professional baseball franchise to try and build a World Series champion. Manage every strategic aspect of your team, play through the season, and lead your team to glory. You're responsible for hiring the right coaches and staff, managing team finances, oof, uh, scouting and drafting players, managing difficult personalities you know if you think the braves should be spending 
500 million like the Mets are, you can try that out at Ultimate Pro Baseball GM. You might get fired, but you can do it. Uh, navigate through your, fr- your franchise through free agency, all the ups and downs of a season. A lot of the locked on MLB hosts are playing the game and playing for big prizes right now. And it's been a lot of fun. So make sure that you go check out Ultimate Baseball at GM. It's completely free and playable offline. Play on the go as you want, when you want to. And Locked On Braves listeners get a 100% free boost to their franchise when using the promo code at Locked On in the game store. So make sure to check it out. To download the game, just visit probaseballgm.com, scan the code, or look it up in the app stores. That's probaseballgm.com, Ultimate Baseball GM. Start your dynasty today. This past week on the podcast, we talked about prospects who could be traded on Miners Monday. We talked about the decision at shortstop to go with Orlando Arcia, what that means for Grissom and Shoemake going forward. We talked about the biggest storylines going into 2023, which is one of my favorite parts of a baseball season. So really loved doing that series again next week. We'll be talking about the breakout candidates, prospect candidates for 2023, which prospects for the Braves, you know, they have one of the the weakest farm systems in all of baseball, but I think there's a lot of talent down in the, the, these rankings in this system that are going to make huge improvements in 2023. We'll talk about those, and then I'll be doing my season predictions episode, and then after that, we're previewing actual regular season games. We are getting ready for the regular season. I can't believe that it's almost here, so super excited about next week. If you're not already, make sure you're subscribed to Lockdown Braves. It's going to have content for you all year long. So make sure you're subscribed podcast or on YouTube. Getting into the questions, Bellfire says, if Shoemake had a midseason call up, I'm hoping we get a repeat of the impact Michael Harris had last season. Do you think it could play out in a similar way? I think it's a great question. I think it's a great thought because it's one I think is very valuable to a team. 162 is a long season and you're seeing the same players every day for the most part in that clubhouse. We hit the dog days of summer. I love baseball. June, July, sometimes I kind of, you know, get into that same routine and I need something to kind of spark life into me. And it's the same way for these players. They need somebody to come in that clubhouse and to just kind of, you know, light a, light another spark in there to get them going. And we've seen it really over the last two years with the Braves, whether it was when the Braves traded for Jock Peterson. Remember, that was a little before the actual trade deadline in 2021. And, I kept saying all that year, this team needs a jolt. This team needs a jolt. It just, they needed something to really get them going. And you trade for Jock and the, you know, somebody with that personality. And I really think that's what kind of kickstarted everything for the Braves in 2021. And then you get the other guys at the trade deadline. It really just boosts the energy and morale, I think, in the clubhouse. And then obviously last year when they called up Michael Harris, team was really struggling. Not only did that just kind of settle things down in the outfield, but You got a young player who's coming up. He's playing out of his mind. He's winning Rookie of the Month awards left and right. You can also say the same for when they called up Von Grissom late. I think he was another spark plug as well when they put Spencer Strider in the fifth starter spot. So I think there are times like that, and I don't know if GMs strategize this or not, but I think there are times like that throughout the season where it really is a benefit whether you can trade for a player or you call up a prospect and just see if that gives the team a jolt. It's not always going to work out, but I do think there's something to that. And I think it's definitely a possibility, whether it's Grissom or Shoemake, who eventually gets called up. And hopefully that's the case, because that, that means one of them is doing well and deserving of getting called up. Hopefully that has the same effect, where if the Braves are in a rut at the big league level, one of them gets called up, and they're playing well, and everybody's kind of rejuvenated again. So I think there's certainly something to that, and I definitely think it's possible for when Grissom or Shoemake get called up. Corey Slovic says, what is your favorite Morgan Whalen song? Um, hope that I said that name correctly. I'm not a country singer, and why is it 98 Brave? So I've had a lot of you ask me about this song. I hardly ever listen to music. I listen to upwards of five plus podcasts a day. And that's really all I have time for whenever I'm listening uh, to the radio. But I did go listen to this song because so many of you had asked me about it. And I got to tell you, it was kind of breaking my heart a little bit, just listening to it and thinking of that 1998 team and how good it was, but how they fell short, which happens in baseball a lot. Sometimes the best team in the regular season doesn't 
win in the postseason happens quite often in the game of baseball, as we know. But that 1998 team, 106 wins, five players with an OPS of 830 or higher. Do we see that with this 2023 team? You had Galarraga with a 991 OPS, Chipper at 951, Javi at 868, Andrew Jones at 836, and Klesko at 832. Four players with 30-plus home runs. Again, do we see that again with this 2023 group? And they had three pitchers with an ERA under three, and obviously uh, those big three in Smoltz, Maddox, and Glavin. All five starters had an ERA of 4.08 or less with at least 16 wins. I mean, this is just an incredible team, but they fell short, losing to the Padres in the NLCS. So, yeah, it was a bit of a heartbreaker listening to it. And just, you know, I enjoyed that run in the 90s and early 2000s where the Braves were in the postseason every year. And I try to look back on it with good feelings, but it does hurt sometimes to think about how some of those really good teams, especially in the, the late 90s, just couldn't get that one more World Series. And so I won't be listening to that song again, even though I thought it was really well done, just because it kind of hurts. <laughs> Um, Steve Lamb says, who would you rather have batting second in the Braves lineup, Harris or Olsen and why? I, I've, we talked about this a little bit during the offseason. I would prefer Michael Harris there if Michael Harris is the 2022 version of Michael Harris. If he's an 800 plus OPS player, if he's hitting 20 to 30 home runs, stealing 20 to 30 bags, I prefer Michael Harris in that two hole just because of his speed ability to get on base and the power that he brings. And because it allows you to lengthen the lineup, I think a little bit by putting Matt Olson in the four hole where he'll be hitting two and three run homers instead of, you know, solo shots potentially in that two spot. Although I know Acuna will probably be on base a lot in front of him, but that's how I would prefer it just because I think it length lengthens the lineup a little bit, but I'm perfectly fine with Olson being there, especially with the way he's hitting in spring training. I, you know, I want him to get as many at bats as possible but the one thing i will say and i was glad to see it with the roster on thursday which was pretty much your starting lineup except for sean murphy will be in there over travis darno but wherever you're gonna put michael harris i hope you put ozzy albies behind him because michael harris struggled against lefties and i'm sure that's still going to continue to be a problem for him in 2023 but if you're going to bring in a lefty to face michael harris punish them with putting Ozzy Albies behind him, who you know crushes lefties. And then if Michael does get on, you got Ozzy coming up with a runner on base facing a lefty because of the three batter minimum. So I hope that's the plan going forward throughout the season that wherever Michael Harris is, if he's batting down in the lineup, obviously if he's batting second, I don't want Ozzy batting third. But if Michael Harris bat is batting in that fifth, sixth spot, I want Ozzy right behind him to try to set up those set up those at bats with Ozzy against a lefty. Uh, Duvall debater says predictions for the Braves record this year and how far of a playoff run they can make. So I'm going to give my official predictions on a full prediction podcast next week, but I've said it on here several times already. I'm, I'm leaning towards 97 wins as my prediction for win totals for this team, but I'm going to save the rest of my predictions for next week. And then this one comes from Clark on YouTube. And I apologize. Some of you send me mailbag questions in Twitter DMs and on YouTube, and I'm, I'm not great at going back and finding those. I really just look at the ones from the tweet that I send out from the main uh, podcast account. But this one from Clark on YouTube he's, who says, Hey, Jake, this question was inspired by all the work Wash was doing with Grissom this offseason. How many coaches do the Braves have, and what are their responsibilities? Wanting to get this in before the real fun begins next week. Go Braves. Great show. Thank you for filling my work day with some entertainment, Clark. Thank you so much for those kind words, Clark. And looking at the Braves roster, they have 14 coaches listed. I'll go over some of the, the bigger ones that you know. Brian Snicker, obviously the manager. Walt Weiss, the bench coach. Pretty much the second manager. Uh, Rick Kranitz, the pitching coach. Kevin Seitzer, the hitting coach. Um, Eric Young, first base coach. And I think he also is the outfield and um, base running coach as well. And then Ron Washington, third base coach and infield coach, obviously very well known with the work that he does with infielders. And you have Drew, F Drew French, who's a bullpen coach. You have several uh, bullpen catchers as well listed on the coaching staff. Sal Pisano, who you saw a lot in those Behind the Braves uh, episodes on YouTube and just the work that he does, and he's really great at that. 
hopefully I say this name right, Bobby Mag Magalanis. I know I messed that up. I apologize. But he's an assistant hitting coach. You're seeing that a lot more in today's game where every team's having at least two hitting coaches. Obviously, Seitzer is the main hitting coach. But I just think it takes, you know, for hitters, it, it's all about hearing the message that applies to you. And so I think it's important to have several different hitting coaches to bounce off different ideas because not everybody's swing – is the same and not everybody's approach is the same. So I think you're going to see this a lot more with major league baseball team. You're already seeing it a lot more with other, other major league baseball teams where you're seeing several hitting coaches, because I just think that's the way the game is going. I think it's a smart way to go about it. You know, hitters need to hear different ideas and different thoughts because not every hitter is the same. Uh, and so I think that's very important. And then chipper also listed on there as a hitting consultant. So, I've said for a while, I think this is the best coaching staff in all of baseball, especially when you look at the fact you have Walt Weiss and Ron Washington, who are both former managers and could probably manage again um, if they wanted to. And Kevin Seitzer, Rick Kranitz are you know known for being the best at, in, in the business at what they do, pitching and hitting coach respectively. So I think it's the best coaching staff in all of baseball, in my opinion. So thanks for the question, Clark. Thanks for the kind words as well next want to get into thursday's game notes where jared schuster had another really solid performance against a mets lineup that was pretty much their opening day lineup minus a couple of players in jeff mcneil and brandon nimmo but he continues to impress with that fifth starter job on the line and matt olson goes deep again what did you expect we'll discuss that next The tournament is heating up, and there's no better pl place or time to get in on the action than FanDuel, America's number one sports book, because new customers get a no-sweat first bet up to $1,000. That's bonus bets back if your first bet doesn't win. Just download the FanDuel Sportsbook app. It's safe, secure, and super easy to use. Then you can bet on everything from the money line to point scores, threes drained. You can get in on the MLB predictions. You want to hear my predictions episode next week, and then maybe go out to FanDuel and play there. You can do that, but I wouldn't take what I say to the bank for sure for anything in baseball um, because baseball, as we know, uh, can be a little bit unpredictable, and that's what makes it so fun. But you can do that if you want to over at FanDuel. Plus, FanDuel lets you combine your bets for a chance at a bigger payout with the same game parlay. So don't miss the chance to get your no-sweat first bet up to $1,000 in bonus bets when you go to FanDuel.com slash locked on. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on to learn more. Also, visit FanDuel.com slash play safe for tools and resources to help you stay in control of the way you play. Make every moment more with FanDuel, an official sports betting partner of the NBA. We're wrapping up spring training now, so there's not a ton to take away. You are starting to see regulars. You know, you're know, you going to see them play back-to-back -back games, full games, full nine innings back-to-back -back here in these last couple of days uh, or leading up to the last couple of days, and then you'll see things ramp back down a bit where players are only getting two or three at-bats and then staying fresh. Please wrap Matt Olson in some bubble wrap and send him home. He went deep again on Thursday, hitting a two-run just mammoth shot. It seems like he has not hit a cheap one all spring. All seven of them that he's hit have been absolute moonshots. So he is ready to go. I'm so fired up for this season for Matt Olson. But Jared Schuster, six innings, two hits, two walks, two earned, two strikeouts. And he said after the game, he really didn't have a good feel for his slider. And he was able to breeze through six innings. I believe he was under 80 pitches. So another really solid performance by him and he did have a leadoff walk that led to the two runs that he gave up in the same inning. Both of them scored on sack flies. One of them, Ronald Acuna, made a just cannon of a throw to home plate, and it skipped by Travis Darno, who couldn't handle the short hop or else the runner would have been nailed at home. It was a beautiful, beautiful throw. The ball getting by Darno also allowed the runner from second to move to, to third, and then he scored on the next ball that was hit deep to center for a sack fly. So, you know, if Darno catches that ball, there's a runner out at home, and that runner probably stays at second, and Schuster gets to this outing without giving up any runs. But regardless, still a really good outing from him. Only two strikeouts, but you got to remember, going up against a Mets lineup who's really good at putting the ball in play. So, again, I've said for a little while now, since it was down to Schuster and Don, I thought Schuster had a leg up just because, you know, more exp experience at the higher levels. I thought he was a little bit ahead of Dodd that, you know, for that reason. But, 
you know, I still think both are going to be very good. And I still think we see both at some point this year and maybe even early on in the year, depending on what happens with Kyle Wright. Uh, bullpen was solid as well. Yates, Litkey, and Minter finished, uh, finished it off, only allowing one hit with four strikeouts. So that's great to see. You know, there's a little concern about the bullpen early in spring training, uh, but they're starting to look like we thought they would. And then Riley and Ozuna each had two hits, and Riley in particular, a couple of balls, he just shot to right field, and it just looked like such a beautiful swing and beautiful approach, just taking what the pitcher was giving him and shooting the ball over second base into right field for easy singles. Ozuna was batting fourth in a lineup that, again, featured pretty much your opening day regulars except for sub and Murphy for Travis Darno. So I don't know what that says for – Ozuna going forward, if Snickers really going to bat him in that four hole, I mean, the way he's hitting lately, maybe you just ride the hot hand there. But I thought that was kind of a significant entry in the lineup with Ozuna batting cleanup behind Riley. Um, so we'll see how that works out. I think that somewhat makes sense. I think the only option there would either to put Murphy there. And then if you do that, you want to get a lefty in there at some point to mix things up. So you got to have to go Harris in the five hole. And then, like I said, I like Ozzy hitting behind Michael Harris. So for me, it's either you bat Ozuna fourth or you bat him seventh. So um, it'll be interesting to see how Snicker you know, puts out the lineup for sure. But I just thought that was really interesting. And a lineup that looked like an opening day lineup for the most part, Ozuna was batting fourth. A little bit of news. We talked about Rysel Iglesias. He's going to start the year on the IL. A low-grade shoulder inflammation injury is what they're calling it. Won't throw for seven days. Obviously, the Braves are going to be overly cautious this time of year. Hopefully, that's all this is and that he'll be back You know, by the end of April. Could open up an opportunity for Ian Anderson to make the opening – or not Ian Anderson, sorry. Uh, Nick Anderson to make the opening day roster. He can be added – for an injured player. You know, he got option, and when you're option as a pitcher, you can't come up for 10 days. So with an injured player, that goes away. So if the Braves were to name Iglesias to the opening day roster, then place him on the IL, then the Braves could call up Nick Anderson, which I think they'll probably do. And, you know, good for, I hate to, you know, see what happened with Iglesias, but good for Nick Anderson because I think he certainly earned that spot in spring training. Dylan Dobb will start against the Red Sox on Friday, trying to match what Jared Schuster did to stay in that race for the fifth starter spot. Soroka said he felt good after 36 pitch outing, which is great to hear. And hopefully that continues. They talked about this on the broadcast a little bit, which by the way, Brandon uh, Godine on the broadcast, his first time, I thought he was fantastic. Uh, really good voice, obviously for what he does. Uh, and I'm just really looking forward to him on the broadcast team this season. But they talked about the fact, you know, Soroka just needs to get in that routine of, pitching every five days and the routine that comes with that. He just hasn't done it for a while. Um, so hopefully, you know, he does get into that. He was optioned to AAA. That does not mean that he cannot make another start in spring training, which I think he will. Uh, either way, he's going to continue to get reps, face minor league hitters. And then I think it's end of April at the earliest, more likely, I think, beginning of May. Like I said, I think they're going to slow play him into the season that we could potentially see Mike Soroka complete the comeback and then some unfortunate news for the Phillies. You really, really hate to see stuff like this. Reese Hoskins suffered a non-contact knee injury. Phillies said it's a left knee anterior cruciate ligament tear that will require ACL reconstruction surgery. Braves fans know all too well about how devastating the ACL injury can be. Really hate it for Reese Hoskins. Believe he was going to be a free agent or he is going to be a free agent after the season. Uh, so really tough news there for Hoskins and the Phillies. So um, certainly well wishes for him. Hopefully he can get back as soon as possible. Want everybody healthy. You know, that's all you wish for as a fan going into a season. You want everybody healthy. You want everybody giving their best all season long. And that's certainly what we're hoping for uh, with the Braves, but for every team as well. I mean, I want to see Mike Trout, Shoei Otani, Mookie Betts. You know, I want to see all the best. Jacob deGrom, I want to see them all healthy and ready to go because uh, I'm a baseball fan at the end of the day, and I want to see the best players play. Jumping into some of the chat comments, um, Gary Gibson said, would, uh, would like Yates, but I feel McHugh is the man, talking about who could step up for closer. Yates just hasn't shown me enough to say that he's ready to close out games again. I know he has the experience, but I, I need to see more from him in high leverage situations in regular season games. McHugh could probably do it, but I think he's great in that sixth, seventh, 
seventh, eighth, you know, a guy that can give you multiple innings type of swing role there in the middle of a game. I, I, I think it's going to be Minter and Jimenez that are going to get the first cracks. Uh, Kate Shaver says AJ Minter, Minter period will the one be the one to get the shot. Um, says Schuster or Dodd have to get a bullpen spot if the Braves don't go with a six man rotation. I've seen a couple of other people say that. I know the Braves did it with Strider last year, but I don't see that happening with Schuster or Dodd this year. I just think whoever loses that job is going to go down to AAA, continue to work as a starter, because you're going to need them as starters at some point. Um, so I don't think that'll be the case. I think they'll both stay as starters at later in the year. There's a bigger need in the bullpen. Then perhaps you move them to the bullpen there uh, at that point. But I don't think early in the season that would be the plan for whoever loses that fifth starter job. Jeffrey Humphrey says A.J. Minter is his choice. Um Slime, Slime says they most definitely go get that first dub win on opening day next Thursday. Certainly hope so. Afternoon game, I'll be streaming that. I'll be streaming on Twitch during that game. You want to come and watch some of that with me. And then obviously we're doing the postcast after that game. AG7 says it's clearly Mentor. Snip basically said it would be. Yeah, I think he's going to get the first shot at it again, but it could be situation-based late in games. AG7, Nick Anderson should absolutely get the open roster spot when Iglesias goes to the IL. He deserved to be there anyway, and I agree. And if it wasn't for, you know, op options and depth and roster manipulation, I think, you know, he was definitely more deserving than some of the other players in the bullpen. Corey Carter, if you go mentor, you weaken the left side of your pen, which I'm not sure you can afford. You still have Dylan Lee. You still have Lucas Litke, which why I think it was very important that they went out and got Litke this post or this offseason. Um, so it gives you two more lefties. And I like what Alex Anthopoulos said about Mentor. We don't view him as just a left-handed reliever to come in and get lefties. He's a guy that gets out lefties and righties. So you still have Dylan Lee. You still have um, Lucas Litke from the left side there. William Fulgham says, Schuster and Dodd make the opening day roster. Very possibly could. And you could put one of them in technically the bullpen early on because you don't need that fifth starter for a couple of days. So you could put both of them on the opening day roster. And then if you, you know, need somebody to come in and give you a lot of length in those first couple of games, you could do that. And then whenever a fifth starter is needed, if Kyle Wright's ready, then you can option, you know, whichever one back down to triple a and bring Kyle Wright in. So I could see that as a possibility for Schuster and Dodd, both making the opening day roster. Uh, Nathan Duffy says, if Harris comes out hot, do we keep him at nine double, lead off or move him to second what it's looking like right now is snickers gonna bat him fifth or sixth in the lineup so i think if he comes out hot he probably just stays there um again i think the ultimate you know spot for him would be second and because you can move olsen down it kind of lengthens the lineup a little bit um but i think he's probably just gonna sit in that fifth sixth spot in the lineup for a good while Matt Cox says, apologize if you've already touched on this, but who do you think is the fifth starter spot, Dylan or Jared? I think it'll be, I think it'll be Jared. I just think he's a, a little bit ahead of um of Dodd at this point, you know, more innings uh, at higher levels. And, you know, he's looked just as good, if not better, than Dodd. So I think that's why he has a little bit of, of the leg up there. Matt Cox, again, I don't listen to much music either, mostly podcasts as well. I'm with Jake, my Morgan Whalen fan friends, and tell them he could have at least picked a year that we went to the World Series. I uh, certainly agree there. Either way, it still hurt just uh, reliving that season and how good that team was. I don't know why any Braves fan would really want to relive that in a song, but I did think that the lyrics were pretty pretty fun, funny as well and had me laughing some. Uh, Shadow Ninja, I'm glad Mike Soroka is back healthy and looking forward to his pitching. I am as well. Hopefully we get the completion of the comeback for him pretty soon. Nathan Duffy, under the radar it seems, but what do you expect from Ozzy coming back? I think Ozzy is a little bit under the radar coming back. I expect gold glove defense um, for sure. I'm excited about that. But I think we still see the same old... Ozzy, I think we see a guy who's very aggressive swinging at first pitch of every at bat. I think we see somebody who hits mid 20s home runs, possibly 30 plus home runs. Somebody who's, I think he's easily a 20 20 player, 20 homers, 20 stolen bases, perhaps even 25 30. Um, somebody who's probably going to hit 250, get on at 310. You know, I've always said I would love to see that, that on base percentage go up even more for Ozzy. That's really the one 
key thing for him if he's going to improve his game. It's just to increase his walk rate and his on-base percentage. You know, if he can get to a place where he's hitting 260, 270 with a 330 on base, then you're talking about all-star Ozzy Albies being back. But I think at the very least you get a 250 hitter, 310 on base, and somebody who's going to hit 20 homers, steal 20-plus stolen bases, batting sixth or seventh in your lineup. AG7, Riley's defense is looking really solid from what I've noticed this spring. Yeah, he's great. I know he made a great play. First play of the game on Thursday. He is fantastic in his area. I just think the only knock on Riley is just the limited range. And you see that sometimes on balls hit down the line. He's not able to get to. That's really the only knock on him defensively is just his lateral side-to-side movement is not there. But I think he's great on balls in front of him. I know there's some people who said the statistics out there say that's not the case, but just from what my eyes tell me, he's great at coming up on balls and he gets everything in his area, um, but just not a lot of range for him. Um, Kwame says, is Murphy Darno combo that much better than Langoliers Contreras? Yeah, I, I would say so. Um, I mean, Murphy, Murphy's a gold glove talent. Maybe, maybe Langoliers gets there. But, you know, Murphy is already there, and Darno is a veteran. He's much better than Contreras defensively, even though I'm on record as saying many times last year, I thought Contreras improved a ton defensively. But you look at the metrics for him, pitch framing, blocking pitches, all of that, Darno is way ahead of Contreras. Contreras, I think, ultimately could be a DH. Um, I think he's better at the bat with the bat than Darno, but just the defensive combination of Murphy and Darno – is going to be one of the best in all of baseball, and both of them are really solid with the bat as well. Shadow Ninja says Spencer Strider's our trump card. I certainly agree. I'm very high on Spencer Strider. Uh, Adele Toto says, do you think Ronald Cunha Jr. is 100% ready to play? Yes, absolutely. And I think he was asked as much on his return from the World Baseball Classic on Thursday. He said he is ready to go. So I'm taking him at his word, and – the fact that if you watch him play in the WBC, I know he didn't have the best results, but he was going, you know, full out. And I think we're going to see that all year from Ronald Acuna Jr. So I do think he's 100% ready to go. I think he's the healthiest he's going to be. My only concern is, you know, you get to game 60, you get to game 120. How is that knee feeling? How is he reacting to that playing every day, playing in the outfield every day? That's my only concern there is does that knee start to, to bark a little bit? Can he play through it? Can he learn to manage that pain? That's the only thing, only real concern I have for him. But as far as right now goes, going into the season, I think he's 100% ready, 100% healthy. Doc's card, Soroka looked solid, a little shaky with the air and a couple wild pitches. He showed some great command and looked strong in the lower body. Yeah, you know, results are what they are. That defense behind him was not great. Um, but, uh, you know, just seeing him out there is all I really need to see. I think he'll be fine. Joe Mee says, still no top 100 prospects, just a bunch of guys ready to help a World Series contending team and be above average major league major leaguers. Yeah, again, I'm going to talk about it on Monday, the prospects who I think are going to have breakout seasons in 2023. But coming into spring training, I was a little worried about the depth in the farm system at the upper levels. But now you're starting the year with Vaughn Grissom and Braden Shoemake at AAA potentially either Dodd or Schuster there, along with Bryce Elder and Ian Anderson, Darius Vines, and others. I'm not going to lie. I paid hardly any attention to the AAA team last year because there just wasn't anybody there worth watching. Now you're going to have Eli White there. You're going to have Jordan Luplo, Forrest Wall, who I'm intrigued to watch. There's going to be a real reason to keep an eye on Gwinnett now and how some of these guys are playing and whether they could come up and fill a major role for the team. So I'm excited about that at the AAA level this year. I think there's a number of guys there that are going to be very, very intriguing to watch. All right, that'll do it for this episode of Locked On Braves. Thank you so much for making Locked On Braves your first listen of each and every day. Now go make your second listen to Locked On MLB podcast where MLB expert Paul Francis Solon brings humor, passion, and a unique perspective on every team talking about the biggest stories from around the league. Again, thanks for listening. Be sure to follow us on Twitter at LockedOn underscore Braves. You can follow me at ShortstopBall. Also, you want to continue this conversation, I'll be on Twitch on Thursday night and Friday night as well, twitch.tv slash shortstopball, playing the new MLB The Show game. You want to come over there and hang out, talk baseball. We can do that there as well. Again, make sure you subscribe to the Lockdown Braves podcast wherever you get your podcast, and we will talk to you next time.